Now, as, far, as far as the good book, the Bible, another problem is what you're holding in your hand as the King James Version of the Bible is just that, King James Version of the Bible. It is not the Hebrew text. You can't verify whether it is properly translated from the Hebrew unless you understand Hebrew or Greek. And that's one of the handicaps that the religion of Christianity has. What it does is it doesn't enforce the language before it gives the child the scripture. It gives them the scripture and never asks them to study the etymology of the language to find out whether or not what's contained in this book is true or false. To say that everything in the Bible is not true would be untrue. To say that everything in the Bible is true would also be untrue. Because I can start from, from, from right here in Genesis and open it and say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Correct? Was that in the beginning or at the beginning? Now, just what did he mean by in the beginning? Because in can imply that this is not at the very beginning. That this is in a period of time within a creation story. And they do those type of things to leave you in a state of confusion while they're talking about where you should direct your soul. They're talking about heaven and hell, judgment, the end, and where people will eventually end up. Yet, the book is vague, extremely vague. And you've been taught that if you question its validity, then you're antichrist. You're taught if you start to ask the reverend to prove points, you must be on the devil's side. You can't possibly be righteous and ask the man about this book and say, well, as far as I'm concerned, I find more inconsistencies in here than facts. If you do that in church, then you are a bad person. So the answer to your question is, no, everything in this book is not wrong. But in fact, the very statement in the beginning, it, in the beginning of God, is a true sentence. Whether or not the actual incident took place is another story. But the grammar is, is correct. <laughs> Whoever selected the nomenclature for that specific chapter at this point, he did a pretty good job. That's true. What it says is not true. It's not, this is not the beginning of the world. This is not the beginning of all creation. Adam and Eve were not the first two people on this planet. And the planet, as they say, was not created 6,000 years ago. And how do we know that? Because, talk to me, say it again. Because it says right inside this book that the goal of Ethiopia was good. And it takes more than 6,000 years for gold to germinate. So now how did God direct goal in Genesis and say the goal of Ethiopia is good after the Bible has just begun, Adam and Eve had just been created one chapter before. Somebody made a mistake in their time zone. What you got to understand is sometimes a person will say that man just began because he's talking about himself and he has history. He doesn't have he keeps out as a history to us and talks to you about history. They are people who began with an Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago. That was their beginning. And they were created in the image and after the likeness of God. That's true. And they did a bunch of devilishment because they're associated with a serpent-like creature. I say serpent-like creature. Because I don't believe, and I hope you don't, brother, that when I open this Bible to Genesis chapter 3, and it says, now the serpent was the most subtle of all the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. I know you don't believe that that was a snake. Because the word there is nasash. It means a whisperer. It doesn't mean a snake. And if it was a snake, you'd have to explain a couple of verses down which species of reptile that you know can hold a conversation. <laughs> that while Eve was moseying in the garden past the tree, a snake leaned over and said, come here. 
<laughs> I want to talk to you and bad mouth God. Again, it said that God created this serpent or made this serpent and therefore gave this serpent the power to think. Right? And this very serpent that God made and gave the power to think thought to talk bad of God to the first creatures created other than him or itself, right? The first thing that came to this creature's mind was to tell these new created beings, don't trust God, right? That don't make no damn sense. <laughs> it don't make no sense 5,000 years ago, and it don't make no sense today. If you want to teach us something, teach us something that makes some damn sense. That's what it's all about. So, brother, the book got some facts in it. <laughs> But as far as it being a guideline to take people back to heaven, an unconfirmed place, as far as it being a manual for doing right and wrong, hell. This book here covers everything from rape to incest to murder to cannibalism. Every type of sin that's on the planet was introduced in this book. You know how I say that? Because you wouldn't even know what sin was if you didn't read the Bible. You were taught what sin was when you read the Bible. When a man tells you what not to do, he's also telling you what to do. When a man says, thou shalt not kill, and at the end of that lecture says, now let's have a feast of an animal which we kill. <laughs> when a God says, Thou shalt not kill, but go and sacrifice for me, Cain and Abel, the first thing, go kill some animal. And then when Cain learns killing is the right thing to do, because God said it's okay, he goes and kills his brother, he said, Well, now, in this case, it's the wrong thing to do. And then human beings convince themselves that God is saying that because they are humans and these are animals. And then scientists come along and say, excuse me, homo sapien is a animal. You're just like any other animal, but you don't have the right to kill. Can you live as a herbivore? Yes or no? Yes. So you don't have to eat animals, do you? No. You chose to tear into the animal. And when you see a cheetah chase down a deer or a gazelle on television, wildlife, and you see a poor deer running, the whole herd, and the cheetah and them starts at him, you go, that's terrible. And when he brings Bambi down, <laughs> and starts to rip Bambi on television, you go, ugh, 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 ugh. You go, that's disgusting. You want to get him and give you something to eat your mother there with a chicken. <laughs> Next season, that you know, that's going. What you gonna make? Fried barbecue, curry. How you gonna do it? Man's problem is man forgets that they are also animals. And if there was a law that said thou shalt not kill, it introduced the opposite right here because God said the greatest thing that ever happened was that I sent my son to be killed for you. Then they turn around and say, us, you know what? You people are potentially suicidal. You know you cult people. <laughs> Don't like to go off and kill yourself. Right? And I said, well, you know, if we did all commit suicide, wouldn't we be doing what Jesus did? <laughs> Because Jesus had an option. And the disciples were saying, Jay. <laughs> While they was in Nazareth or in Brooklyn, the disciples were saying, Why the hell are we going to the Bronx? <laughs> Jesus said, Well, some people in the Bronx just want to kill me. And they said, That's what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> Why are we going to Nazareth? Why are we going over to where there is power in the hands of the Pharisees and the Jews 
to say, Jesus, who want to kill you? Jesus said, because it's my hour of deliverance. You know what I'm saying? When he finally convinced the disciples, he added, so, sell your sandals and buy a sword. It's the hour of deliverance. Sell your sandals and buy a sword. So he must have meant for them to defend himself. Now, did he know that they were going to be attacked? Or was he assuming? The question is, were they attacked? Think before you answer. Were the disciples attacked in the garden? No. Who they come for? Who they get? So now, think before you answer, y'all. Did Jesus make a mistake by telling them to buy swords for a fight that never happened when he was supposed to be God and should have known whether or not it would have happened ahead of time? Yeah. He said, go get swords for a fight that did not take place. So Jesus does not know the future. But he knew enough to know that he was supposed to die in Jerusalem. So much so that when it came time to die, he said, oh, my father, you must pass me. <laughs> Let this death or this cup pass from me. He was born to die, willing to die, a willing sacrifice for my sins, you keep telling me. Jesus loved you so much that he was willing to die for you. And you keep adding that word willing. When I read the Bible, he was not willing to die. Right. He was willing his ass off. <laughs> he was afraid of death. He tried to get away from it. Right? So, it's a nice book. <laughs> Longs on the shelf with Stephen King. <laughs> Side of the Quran, a whole bunch of other garbage is put together to entrap our minds and take us away from reality. So we become dependent upon other than the God that is our own self that make things happen. They have scientists have proven without a shadow of doubt that women possess a latent power and a latent strength that under pressure, women have lift up trucks. You know that? Women have saw their children beneath a tree and lift up a whole tree and got their child. Where's that power reserved? What's it for? And why aren't you able to bring it to the front and use it at random? I'll tell you why. Because from the kindergarten, they taught you to believe this crap and that you don't have any powers and that God controls all the powers and that you're just a weak, evil, needing, dependent creature that needs an unverified deity to guide you through life and through death. And with that belief, you cut off your divinity. You cut off your power. But when they tell you stories about the ancient Egyptians, Pharaoh didn't walk across the desert, you understand? With the intentions of freeing his people in the name of his God and fell. Moses did. Moses crossed the desert to go to Pharaoh with the intentions of freeing his people in the name of his God. And when he got before Pharaoh, he turned, or his brother, turned or stabbed into snakes and looked at Pharaoh as if that was a miracle. Right? And Pharaoh said, oh, shit. <laughs> he said, Jeffrey, come here. Is that recorded in this Bible? Yeah, right. Go and do the, do the snakes. 
snake thing, man. He sat way down the chain of magic tricks. And he went and did it. And then Moses had his snake eat up their snake, right? But were they capable of doing the same trick that Moses and his brother asked their God to give them? Yes or no? Yes. So Moses and his brother Aaron turned to God and said, turn this into a snake. I need your help. I need your power. I need your strength. And God said, you got it. Boom! <laughs> and Pharaoh said, that's what makes you a God? He didn't do it himself. He called a man out and said, do the snake trick. <laughs> That would render the Pharaoh a god. For the other question, are we gods? Yes, as long as we stand in the courts of the Pharaohs, we, have, we are as equal as the god of this Bible. And the god of this Bible trusts us so much that whenever the children that he was supposed to be guiding was stressed, or their land became famine or desolate, he would tell them, I know where there's another God. <laughs> and his crops grow. <laughs> Take and go down to Egypt and sojourn there until further notice. I'll call you later. Don't call me. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, that's what your Bible says your God did. Your God told him, Joseph. Yeah? Herod wants to kill you in the kid. My kid. Check that. This is God, man. Send his angels, his own messenger to talk to Joseph. Right? And said, Herod wants to kill you and the boy. Take the boy. God incarnate. Take him into Egypt and stay there until Herod dies. Now I don't know about you, but my mind said that whoever was talking didn't have the power to say to Herod, Herod, I created the sun, moon, and stars. Every animal that creepeth upon the planet. The breath in your body. You understand? If you touch my son, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> you may not like the way that sounds, but that's coming from the Wapo language. Where we come from the heart and the head and not the bullshit. You ain't used to a reverend standing in front of you cursing, but you're going to have to live with that. Because when that nigga leaves the pulpit and goes home, he curses at home. The only thing between me and him, if I get mad, he curses at your ass in church. I'm not going to put up no front and stand up and play holy and bow in front of the congregation and know I'm a slime ball when I get out of church on Sunday afternoon. Let's set the record straight on that right now. But the focus is on the power of your God. Your God could not stop Herod from killing his son on the spot. He had to send him on a vacation to Egypt until Herod dies. Why couldn't your God have stopped Herod right there? Why couldn't he have removed the thought of killing Jesus out of his mind? Why couldn't he have made Herod disappear and his father and his father's father and his father's 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 father made Herod something that did not... Why was Herod born? Why was he bad? Why was he a ruler at that time? Why was he... You know what I'm saying? Why does God have to worry about what a man could do to his son? Now, I, as a God, have to worry about what a man can do to my son. Because I'm not professing to be no omnipresent spirit flying over everything. I'm in everybody's kitchen and everybody's bathroom and everybody's bedroom telling people what they should and should not do while I don't do shit for people.
they were happening in the town right now. The Reverend was trying to write something. Yeah, I want to tell you this morning. The Reverend in that little town walking something. And he said, God does not desert you. <laughs> that's what he said. That's his, that's his sermon about the death. I, I wish I could have got to him so I could say, then what was one of those kids yours? Because it's easy for you to say that shit, because you sitting up there in the church, you know, a faggot unmarried. <laughs> Against the Bible, which says be fruitful and multiply, you are unfruitful and unpentant. <laughs> so you don't know about the affection of having a child that you raised in love. It's easy for you to open this book and say, let me find something to lamentate him. God loves you. Where the hell was God when the kid was pulling the trigger? I mean, why did God let it happen? You gotta go where? Malachi is taking you. So you don't misconstrue how I'm teaching you. Because it's easy to go to the point and say he's an antichrist. But one day I'm going to Stay with me. The point is, why would God allow that much sorrow, that much pain, that much hurt to innocent families in your quiet, nice neighborhood? Where apparently your statement meant it's all right when it happens to us. But to you, it's not supposed to happen. Why does God let things like that happen? Let's talk tornado. Let's talk flying babies. I'm not talking about the one we talked about two weeks ago. We are now standing here two weeks later and we got a whole lot more of messing up people's lives on behalf of your God. Is it necessary? The question is, does God have the power to prevent the tornadoes? Can he direct the tornadoes? Send them away from the children. Okay. While he send them down the streets where the prostitutes and the pornography stores are and wipe that shit out. Well, he sent them to the neighborhoods where the crack houses are. And it's a problem because you know a tornado can knock down what about one house, pick up, and knock down again. Why ain't God aiming this shit? Because I know some niggas that need to be tornadoes. But you want to sit around and huddle together in little rooms and make life God got power. Y'all better wake up. Mother Nature got the power. Mother Nature knocks on God's door. Oh, let me tell you why and how. Knocks on the church door. And if God don't open the door himself and say, you can't knock this church down, tornado or fire will knock the church down. I'm saying that to say, if God was in the church, I'm quite sure because God can throw tornadoes, he wouldn't send a tornado to a church in which he is standing. That's right. You hear me? That's right. So now churches are flying through the air. I saw them on television go, Time here, y'all. And before I finish beating up this hell and this Koran, this bullshit, and all the crap they stuffing on us, we will talk about the day and time we're in. We'll talk from a book that is accurate. We'll talk from a book that predicts things and they do happen. We'll talk about that. Right? But meanwhile, back at the church. <laughs> You're trying to lead me into the hands of an unconfirmed God or situation. And if you can tell me something better, Christian brother, sister, or Muslim brother, sister, stand up and tell me something better about why your God lets these things happen to innocent people. 
Why? Why is, and I've said this a million times, why is there evil? You know why? Because someone creates it. Now, let me say this to you. If you're in a situation where there's a bunch of good people, yeah, and one person goes off and does something evil, who do you call that person? The devil. Correct? He creates a devilish situation. He becomes a... Let me see. Y'all with me? Okay. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. According to this Bible, who created the devil? Now, if I come into your neighborhood and take a good person and turn them into a devil, I become a if I create a devil to do devilishment, then I must be a So this God created the devil. Yeah? And after he created the devil, the devil went about his business of doing some devilishment. And messed up Adam and Eve's lives by stepping into the heart of one of Adam's sons who took the life of his brother. That's after he met them, and the devil with his devilish men. Because, you see, Adam and Eve didn't know good and evil yet. So they couldn't have been devilish, you hear me? So, I asked the Christian and the Muslim, why did the loss of Hanoi Ba'ana? Or, Jesus, or Yahweh, or his way, or whatever, why did he create a devil? Yes, the nation of Islam say, why do you tell the devil we can really give the power to rule the world for 6,000 years? They say, so the Lord will show forth his power and he's all wise like exactly to come. It's only the time to take the devil off the planet. And they think that's an answer. You heard that you five percent of God and earth or nation of Islam is no front happen. But you're not listening. God created the devil so that he could come to show somebody something. Why? Why does God have to come and why does God have to prove himself to you if God indeed created you and the breath is in your body? I mean this God. You better guard yourself against this crap. That's what you better do. But this is dangerous medicine. This has people, God I'm saying, this has people up there who got struck by tornadoes going to church Sunday and saying, oh, God, we know that you were good. We know we have your blessing. Now, my, my baby's dead. See, I would be the fool in the church that said, well, tell God to bring my baby back. You say there's nothing that, that uh, God cannot do. And Jesus brought people back from the dead. And you say that Jesus is on church Sunday, that's why we're here. And this Sunday morning, Lord, I'm here. Red, I know you said God talks to your heart. We all here in this congregation would like to take a few moments so you can get to the telephone and call God. So he can straighten this shit out down here. Or oh, I'm not putting no more money in his banquet. Or no more time inside his book of my deeds that he should be controlled. And when you do that, you know what? A red flag goes up. It starts off with a statement, oh my God, what's going on out there? What's going on out there is what we're asking for the tornadoes been around us. Throwing houses, churches, schools, pass right by us. We were calling us, huh? Y'all all right down there? Like, y'all really don't believe, huh? <laughs> Something wrong with you? Yeah. Ain't no business here flying. That's the day and time we're in. Because we were forewarned about this. You were taught about this. 
so that you can remove the spell of ignorance from yourself. Move with blindness. What's the blindness? Belief. The power of belief. I keep drilling this into you. Because once they got you believing, they can get you believing anything about anybody without free investigation. They tell you, man, that guy in York out there in York, he's, I think he's some antichrist. And all the people who want to believe that say, hmm. Some other people say, well, I'm the type of person that I'm going to go out there and find out my, for myself. Oh, you better not go out there. They'll keep you out there. <laughs> They'll chop you up. I heard they cook people in there. It, gets, it has to get more dramatic. He said, well, I'm going to go out there and get chopped up. I'm going to go out there and see what the niggas are doing out there. When they come out here, they say the same thing. Why are they doing this? And I say, because we broke the spell. And they're afraid that this is spreading. And that they lose the image of the beast, as this book talks about, that they have instilled in our minds, that they lose our concept of beauty, and like I said before, this award, Erica Bardo walked up in front of little Kim with a gay lay on, like these sisters over here, and a tight skirt along the ground, and she stood there with the award like this. I said, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> And walked off, right? The difference between me and you. When I watched it, when you watched it, it was two different things. When I watched it, I smiled inside. Because I saw the waffle in its fullest effect. But she, but she had to say, and I would like to say thanks to my producer, Kidon. And I laughed and I raised Kidon. I laugh because Kedar's mother is with us here. Right. I laugh because Kedar is a Muwapian too. Right. I laugh because Muwapians triumphed over that devilishment in front of everybody right. who watched that and they didn't even know it. and move into music business and push in culture over all the crap and take all the awards in the name of the new and walk away.
down here to realign ourselves, to wait for that day. We didn't call the eye in the ground. Our ancestors put that out there so the newscaster should have enough sense while he was in the helicopter flying over and say, oh my God, look. Then ask us, did we do it intentionally? My mission. All I came to do is set the whole mess straight. All I came to do is set the whole mess straight. All I came to do is set the whole mess straight. All I came to do is set the whole mess straight. Everybody from Shango, <laughs> Ogun, Obatala, we are ancestors that you don't know about. They're waiting for us. Whether we're in Haiti or in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico or Cuba or in America or in Nigeria, we got ancestors that are working with us. We got powers. I was watching television and people was running around doing that tornado, and I was looking for the New Orleans. I was <laughs> it's not fair, but hell, God was aiming. God be aiming, God be like, that ain't good. <laughs> the energies in us are coming back. It was announced on television last week that the disease of Alzheimer's disease is found predominantly in Latinos and Negroes. Only. That's good. That's good news to me. You know why? That tells you that we are genetically the same. If it's only found in Latinos and Negroes, then they must have names that don't apply to them. Because genetically, we must be the same. And now we need to drop Latino and Negro and pick up New Orleans. <laughs> well, you said that shit, not us. You tried to divide us for years, making us think we're different. But the conga told us we were the same. The rhythm told us we were the same. The spiritual power told us we were the same. Whether it was Santaria for Django or Yoruba for Shango, that told us we were the same ancestors. Now you got to confess that we are the same. We the Wapians already knew it and already came back to one family and are going all over the world. And we don't breed roaches. <laughs> well, we wasn't here. We got here, roaches are already here. You brought roaches from Europe with you.